Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Psychedelics Today. This is Joe Moore coming at you from uh, Phoenix, Arizona, actually, for Solidarity nice. Fridays. <laughs> Kyle Buller, Michelle Janikian. How are you, how are you both doing? Really doing good. Well, doing well, Hi. thanks. Good. Um, should reach 100 degrees here today. That'll be exciting. Um, Damn. <laughs> and we'll see what happens. Yeah, it's nice to give my body a chance to recover. So I'm into it. It's um, already a hundred degrees in May. Jeez, I had no idea. <laughs> yeah, I think they hit a hundred in April. Um, wow. Even so, who knows? I, I don't really understand how this place works, but uh, <laughs> it can be beautiful, <laughs> but it can be extreme. So, um, all right, yeah. Before we jump in, just want to let everybody know May twenty is approaching, and we've got um, what about fifteen spots left in navigating psychedelics for clinicians and therapists across the two courses. So if you want to get in, please secure your space soon. Um, from the date of recording, you got 15 days, but when you hear this, you'll have 13 days to get in. So come on down, learn more over at psychedeliceducationcenter.com. Uh, we've got some amazing testimonials up there and you can learn more about the class and, and do reach out if you have questions. Support at Psychedelics today if you need anything answered about the course. Um, it is CE approved. Um, what else do we have? We have a birthday party coming up, five-year birthday party. May 13. Is that the day we picked? I think yeah. that's it. Yep. Thursday. Yeah. So um, stay tuned to your email and socials if you want to learn more about that. Uh, we're going to have kind of a long discussion, open for questions, and then followed by a DJ, um, Dr. Bouchard. <laughs> I'll let you all guess who that is. <laughs> and, uh, and Kyle, you've got this serotonergic psychedelics course coming up. Can you talk about May that? Yeah, May 18th. That's a Tuesday. It's going to be at 7 p.m. Eastern. Mm. Um, this will be an hour and a half, an hour presentation by Dr. Melanie uh, Pincus. And we will be exploring the neuroscience of serotonergic psychedelics. Um, so exploring compounds like psilocybin, LSD, DMT, the classical tryptamine compounds. Um, CE approved for 1.5 credits. Um and it is live, so you need to attend live. It, there won't be a, a, a replay or to get those CE credits. So um, if you're interested, check that out. You go to psychedelicstoday.com slash events, um, and then that will bring you over to the, the Shopify page where you can purchase that. So yeah, I'm excited. The, we did uh, another one, I don't know, a couple months ago at this point on ketamine. Um, went really well, got a lot of great feedback. Um, Melanie is very in depth with her presentations. So I'm really excited to see what she's bringing to the table this round. That awesome. sounds so cool. I really want to come to this one. <laughs> Big trip to be yeah, fan be over there. here. <laughs> well, if you have the time, join yeah, us. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Yeah, great. All right. So let's dig in, starting with um, a new policy update. What was it, Maine, Michelle? Yeah, so last week in the marijuana moment, Ben Adlin uh, reported that a Maine proposal would legalize psilocybin mushroom therapy for adults. No medical diagnosis needed. It was a big headline. It got a lot of uh, engagement on social media. So I took a little look. And yeah, basically a um, Democratic senator in Maine, Donna Bailey, uh, wants to follow in Oregon's footsteps and um, allow 21 adults, 21 and older, to um, legally purchase psilocybin products from retailers and consume them, but under the influence of a, quote, licensed psilocybin service facilitator. Um, but, you know, not having the medical diagnosis. Uh, so anyone that, you know, wants to work on anything, personal growth, just have the experience, spiritual growth, would be able to do that in this system, um, um, which is cool. It kind of feels like the dominoes are following in the U.S. around at least specifically psilocybin-assisted therapy, right? Um, what did you guys think of this Was one? the language different in that it was like around facilitators versus centers? Possibly. I haven't read the say, actual uh, bill. Facilitators. It does say facilitators in this article. Oh. Um. That would be really different if it democratizes it further that way. Um, away well, from it's interesting because like they're talking about like, site. yeah, it, it's talking about, uh, yeah, these 
purchase uh, psilocybin products from a retailer and consume under a quote unquote uh, licensed psilocybin service facilitators. Um, and it sounds like um, as this as introduced this week, the bill would issue licenses to businesses to legal, legally produce and sell the drug. The state would tax psilocybin products at 15% of retail sales prices. Um, yeah, so, and it would um, yeah, also it, try it, to that, establish that does sound interesting. An, uh, an advisory board similar to like Oregon. I mean, you know, it's exciting, right? I mean, that is really cool. I think having access to psilocybin assisted therapies is great, but <laughs> I guess I, I always, when I read these, like I understand that maybe totally you know, regulating and legalizing psilocybin for sale without the facilitator component is like a little radical for the mainstream to handle. But I do, I do think about it. I do hope that this is a first step toward that. Maybe we can show how safe and gentle psilocybin can be and that the facilitator aspect should be a choice among people and not a necessity in my, you know, very radical opinion over here. <laughs> But um, I know baby steps are going to have to be necessary. And I'm, I am a realistic person despite all my mushroom use. So uh, <laughs> it's still exciting. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? It's like um, we've been kind of saying, or I've been saying this for a while about um, even all these decrim nature bills and like the psilocybin bill in Denver that Kevin Matthews was on. Like there's, these things are all baby steps yeah. and mm -hmm. um, these included. So we've got to, you know, we're digging out from like a multi-billion dollar drug war and um, all that propaganda and violence against us. Like drugs have been used as weapons against us and this is part of it. And, you know, we've got a long way to go to build legitimacy, to get more acceptance because culture doesn't even understand this cognitive liberty concept yet. No. Um, they don't, they kind of barely understand the therapeutic angle. You know, we can thank somebody like Gwyneth Paltrow for raising this a little bit more and people like Dost and all the filmmakers and popularizers, you know, even Joe Rogan playing part in that DMT film by Mitch Schultz, like these things, tilt, you know, shift the needle, move the needle. And, you know, even somebody like Michael Pollan can help move the needle though. You know, he of course wants to make sure we're all safe. You know, thank you, Mr. Pollan, um, <laughs> by taking a more cautious approach, which I disagree with, but I understand why he would want to do that. I um, guess for me, like, isn't saying that you need a facilitator to have a psilocybin experience propaganda in its own right, like a different type of propaganda? It's not true, right? Like, you know, what is propaganda? It's like using communications and techniques to shift popular opinion towards, you know, where individuals want to go. Like it's the origins of PR. It's the origins of, you know, mass psychology of fascism. Like Hitler wouldn't have happened without a good thorough knowledge of propaganda. Um, same with Trump. So, well, I guess any kind of leader at that scale for that matter. Um, propaganda is essential for <laughs> steering the ship in the right direction. And it's like, what is the right direction? Is it to extinction or is it to a happy, healthy planet, <laughs> you know, with, you know, interspecies communication, interstellar travel, all that kind of fun stuff. I just so. wish that, yeah, the ship was being steered just more toward liberty and personal freedom, you know, like that's, I hope that this is like a small step toward that, but sometimes I worry that it's not. And the mainstream narrative will stay in this kind of, you know, idea that it's not safe for you, normal human, to take a psychedelic without a trained professional nearby when, you know, hundreds of thousands of teenagers have been taking mushrooms and been fine for decades. So I don't know, not just teenagers, obviously, but I just, I just hope that this is like a steering in a more liberty direction and not just steering psychedelics into this little box where everyone's comfortable and a certain amount of people can make money and we don't have to fear or anything and we can still kind of keep a stigma against it that they're dangerous and scary and only you know okay when you use them in this 
this very controlled environment. And not that like controlled environments mm. are bad, but I think as humans, as adults, we can make our own controlled environments if we give it some thought. But I am, I am, you know, not in the majority and leading the narrative here, but I just like to say that, you know, while I'm here, um, that there are other ways of thinking about this. Anyway. Um, didn't they just pass a bill to, or like, isn't Maine looking at a bill around decriminalizing all drugs? I think so. Yeah. I think they just, right. um, so it's a nice conjunction of very, again, very similar to what Oregon did though. All drugs is a misnomer on Oregon. We've got something in the works on that. Um, Kyle, any commentary from the therapist in the room, um, <laughs> about all this? Um, there's a few things that are popping up and I mentioned this, uh, before we got recording, I was just chatting with somebody who was like reminiscing on, um, buying mushrooms at a smart shop in Amsterdam. And it just like made me realize like, oh wait, some of these frameworks are already in place in like other countries for, you know, a limited time. You know, I know that they got rid of like cubensis and mushrooms and now they're only selling truffles, but, um, you know, it seemed like that was working. I'm, I forget what the reason was behind them, um, getting rid of, uh, regular mushroom products and just focusing on the truffles. Um, I don't know, maybe there are some incidents. It was an accident. I think it was somebody fell. Um, mm. and got hurt, a, a tourist specifically. So, yeah. you know, to keep a tourism live and well, one death is enough to change the drug laws. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, from the, the therapist in the room here, um, you know, I think working on this project for a while, um, for five years, <laughs> um, you know, my, my, uh, my, my stance has shifted a little bit of, you know, even questioning a lot of the therapists that continue to use that narrative that it needs to be under therapy, like, you know, kind of do your own like check-in and how did you get introduced to this? Um, and was it under therapy and how many therapists that are, you know, kind Kind of pushing this have actually had psychedelic assisted therapy probably not many most of everybody's introduction was um you know maybe with friends or however you're doing it um and you know that was my introduction and i still had a, a really profound experience and found it very therapeutic and you know it wasn't in conjunction with therapy um and then you know we also have to be honest that even with supervision <laughs> things happen. Um, there was uh, an article that somebody shared with me. Um, I believe this person was in Israel. And so it was an Israeli man who they didn't say what type of medicine that they were using. Um, the person that sent it to me mentioned that it might've been psilocybin, but this person in, in the article, it was stating that they, they were engaging in alternative, um, therapies and somebody mentioned a pill. Um, you know, maybe they got the wrong pill or something like that, but this person had a very mystical experience, um, and had, you know, mystical visions and ended up stabbing, I think their 14 year old son, um, to death, um, after, uh, a psychotic episode or spiritual emergence arised. Um, so had these very religious images and then kind of, yeah, I, I would say probably went into spiritual emergence and, you know, in the article is saying that they were seeing a therapist or a provider that was, you know, engaging in this alternative treatment. Um, again, didn't go into details of what happened there, but things happen. Um, and even under, you know, that supervision, um, these things, you know, doesn't, doesn't like it lessens the risk a little bit, maybe, but you know, it's still, there, there's still possible risks here. Um, and this is something, you know, we've been talking about is just spiritual emergencies unfolding and does psychiatry even have a framework to help that. Right. So, you know, are they opening people up and, and not having a, an idea on, on how to work with these experiences down the line when stuff like that emerges? Um, so my critiques, <laughs> But I'm excited to see that Maine is um, using this language for, um, you know, non-medical diagnosis, 
which I think is, you know, again, they're baby steps and an important first step. And I think an important first step away from, you know, the quote unquote medicalization where you you need some sort of medical diagnosis, right? So I think that that is an important step. And I'm glad that they're kind of following after Oregon there that opens up accessibility and how many people would benefit from, you know, spiritual exploration, personal development um, that, you know, might not necessarily meet a, a, a criteria, a mental health criteria. So um, I'm excited about it. I think it is a, a good first step and, you know, maybe not ideal for some of us that have more of these quote unquote, like radical beliefs and, you know, more oriented towards cognitive liberty. And um, we just see that, you know, people can can have some of these experiences, but by themselves or with local peers and friends and still be relatively safe and have very profound therapeutic experiences. So, Yeah, absolutely. No, that's a heavy story and not to like demean it at all, but I do imagine like if you looked at the amount of violence perpetuated under alcohol influence, you know, right? So like, is it really like, uh, I don't know. It's Drunk driving accidents and deaths too. Or even like, just like violence, course. violence against women, violence against people in yeah. public, like and and the drunk, you know, group mentality. And should we at least like you know pro- prohibit alcohol because of that? Like because a couple individuals, you know, take things or you know they, I don't know how to phrase it exactly, but because it's not safe for every single person. But nothing is really safe for every single person. That's a good point. But I don't know. But that's it's a lot to think about. I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, alcohol is probably of view. much worse in in the terms of violence, right? Just got me thinking. I was talking to a police officer um, in Burlington years and years ago, just talking about like um, marijuana versus alcohol. He's like, I'd rather deal with quote unquote potheads and alcoholics <laughs> or people that are you know drinking all the time. He's like, and he told me this really like graphic story of approaching somebody outside of a bar. Um, this guy got pissed at some other guy because he was like staring at his girlfriend, took a knife out, stabbed him. Um, it's like, how often do fights break out with with alcohol? And for some reason, we just like look the other way um, and we just go, oh, well, it's socially acceptable to to drink and, you know, do whatever. Actually, New Jersey, Murphy just uh I uh, did a little kind of campaign. If you get your vaccine, you get a free beer at um, participating breweries. <laughs> it's just like, it got me thinking. I'm like, oh man, like that's the culture we live in. Like get vaccine, drink, drink, you know? Um, and I'm like thinking like, how about a free joint now that it's legalized here in, in Jersey? Can you like do that? <laughs> And isn't even safe to drink right after the vaccine. I know the one they're giving out here in Mexico, it's different. It's a one-time shot, the like China Russian one. But my friends who are professors just got it and they were told when they got it, they couldn't drink for two weeks. And that's like how they had to take care of themselves afterwards. And so like, yeah, we didn't have any carne asada that weekend. We were like, actually, we're going to (laughs) wait. But uh, yeah, weird. Yeah. I mean, isn't psilocybin decriminalized now too? Can you just give me an eighth of mushrooms instead, Phil Murphy? (laughs) Just kidding. Well, it's still a misdemeanor charge. I know, I know. It's not as good as I want it to be. Penalty from a felony. Thank you, thank you, Kyle. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So, what do we have next? This maps article uh, from the New York Times. Let's do it. Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was uh, decent. You know, it it certainly um, seemed relatively fair. Even the critique from the um, unaffiliated psychiatrist, uh, I think former professor at Duke. Mm -hmm. Like I thought that was even a nice, you know, tempered response. Um, You know, things are likely optimal in clinical trials relative to what they're going to look like in, in the wild. Even with that said, I think we're in good shape. Yeah. And the expectation effect is so real. Right. And I think that's kind of what he's getting at, but just to back up really quick. So this was an article in the New York times, um, 
it was it's on the front page of the national section in the print issue on Tuesday, May 4th. And the title is A Psychedelic Drug Passes a Big Test for PTSD Treatment. And they're talking about MAPS' MDMA Phase 3. Finally, uh, the first Phase 3 trial has just finished. It'll be published, I think, in Nature Medicine later this month. But the New York Times got the scoop. And it interviewed, um, yeah, the head author of the paper, as well as some unrelated psychedelic therapists and other psychiatrists like the one Joe was just mentioning is um, Alan James Francis, is a professor and former chair of psychiatry at Duke University. Um, And he warned in this New York Times article, new treatments are, quote, never as wonderful as they first seem, Um, which is kind of a healthy approach to this, you know, from the really excited psychedelic like Rick Doblin, you know, quotes and stuff. There's also just like, listen, a lot of this could be more about, yeah, the expectation part of being part of something really, really exciting. Although I don't fully believe that. I do really believe that MDMA is helping people with PTSD. PTSD like a lot when you look at the comparison between the control group and the MDMA group. Um, you know, the MDMA group does get a lot better than, but the control group still had like 30% of people in remission. Do we have the actual numbers here? I have um, two months after treatment. Yeah, so. Uh, yeah, please, Kyle. Oh, you can go if you got it up. I, I Yeah. Two months after treatment, 67% of participants in the MDMA group no longer qualified for a diagnosis of PTSD, which is really huge. But 32% of the placebo group also didn't qualify, which points to the power of like the therapy and this whole process of, you know, getting really close to these therapists, being part of something bigger than you that's so exciting and important and really feeling maybe a sense of of like value and importance in your life, which can be, you know, um, really lacking of people that are really struggling with depression and PTSD and being part of something like a clinical trial like this with all the news and everything around it has a big effect on how it affects people. Um, so there is a lot to think about, yeah. but, um, still really exciting. And then there, you have to do another phase three trial before it can go through the F like that's part of the FDA process. So they're doing another phase three trial. It says it's currently underway in the New York times with a hundred participants. And, um, they think the FDA, um, approval could come as soon as 2023 is the new date. So awesome. Well, awesome job, Maps. Um, very exciting. I know we've all been uh, looking forward to hearing these results over the years of, of, as they push through with phase three. Um, something else that I found pretty interesting. So again, like recapping that. So they were, um, <clears throat> this was with 90 patients with severe chronic PTSD. Um, and so 46 participants received MDMA therapy and 44 participants received therapy with placebo. Um <clears throat> And 67 no, with the MDMA group, 67 no longer qualified for PTSD. And 88% of participants experienced a clinically significant reduction in symptoms with the MDMA group. While the placebo group, um, 32% no longer qualified for the PTSD diagnosis at two months follow up, and 60% experienced a clinically significant reduction in symptoms. And I think that's huge. Looking at 60% of participants just experiencing significantly. Uh, you know, a significant reduction in in symptoms. I mean, I think that's that just shows again the power of maybe the protocol there with the therapy and getting so much individual attention, um, and you know, having those long therapy sessions. Um, yeah, that that's really fascinating in, in my mind. Yeah, are they multi-hour therapy sessions? <clears throat> Yeah, because you don't know if you're getting placebo or uh, the MDMA, right? So you're having those multi-hour sessions, like six hours or so, with the music, with that same process. So I think that just shows the power of maybe even fostering that type of inner experience, focusing on the inner healing intelligence with the with the music and really kind of tuning inward. Um 
that's my take on it. But yeah, when I saw that 60%, just the the reduction, I thought that was it's pretty good. Right? That's huge, right? Compared to what are the other standard treatments for PTSD and the, uh, you know, progress levels, I don't think they're that high. And so there's definitely something to be said about, yeah, not just MDMA, right? But this therapy protocol and just the attention people get, I think is really powerful. So I was talking to somebody recently and... um you know, talking about non-psychiatric applications and uh, of psychedelics. And the idea was that these things could be like um, just boosters, results boosters, effect boosters um, for things that do work, but maybe not well enough for some people. Because, you know, therapy is pretty helpful for a lot of folks. And um, there's other applications that are pretty helpful for folks. And you slap this thing on and hopefully it makes that thing better. Um, is, is kind of what we're seeing. Um, yeah. Cause you know, therapy is so diverse that we don't really have yeah. great numbers to, that help us speak about therapy. Um, you know, somebody said something the other day to me about, um, you know, when Stan Groff would come to New York, um, he would do a lot of breath work with people like large group sessions. All of a sudden, all the therapists were very busy afterwards and somebody <laughs> like the person talking to me kind of phrased that negatively or I'm like, well, you know, I think that might actually be a good thing. It's showing that these people are starting to engage in their inner work and what's going on inside of them. You know, it, so I, I find that a really complicated narrative. Um, mm. But, you know, especially if we don't think of people being in therapy as a net positive, they only go when they have something wrong as opposed to going because you're just, you're doing life and shit adds up and sometimes you need help. Um, yeah. So I, I found that interesting. Um, but Kyle, is there any kind of like clean data on talk therapy generally? Um, just in general with PTSD or any just- indications? Like I don't, I don't really know any of the figures whatsoever just around like standard talk therapy. I can't think of any of the figures off the top of my head, but yeah, I mean, if you look at the evidence-based practices like CBT and whatnot, like there's figures there. Um, Even I'm just thinking back to like my capstone paper, um, exploring PTSD, like psychotherapy was definitely most beneficial um, with like adjunct to to medication. Uh, Most people found it beneficial, but you know, you also get a lot of dropout rates there too. Um, You know, in-depth psychotherapy can be expensive if you know, you're not covered by insurance or you have out of pocket. Um, and I think that's the one benefit of like the MDMA therapy here is, um, being able to like maybe connect with your therapist, um, bringing up those traumas in therapy right off the bat with talk therapy might be too triggering. Um, and that's why a lot of people end up dropping out because they might feel like it's just making things work by talking about it versus like having this therapeutic session where, you know, maybe you're, you're, it's not as triggering, right? So if we look at the science there, right, it's the um, decreased blood flow to the part of the amygdala, which is that fear processing center. And so people are able to explore those traumas without, you know, having that, that activation. Um, So. Yeah, no, when Joe was talking, it reminded me just like, isn't it Stan's graph phrasing that psychedelics and I think breath work and non-ordinary states of consciousness are non-specific amplifiers, right? Kind of makes sense that after breath work, more people are like are booking more therapy sessions because shit bubbles up. And now they realize like, I have to do something about yeah. it because we can go in our everyday lives just like in survival mode and just kind of like push this stuff down, just keep going, keep producing, keep taking care of the kids like whatever. And then when we give ourselves a little space to have an experience to allow stuff to happen, and then all this stuff comes up that we've been just pushing down to move forward, it's a lot. And like, yeah, you gotta, I guess like part of like our whole mission, right, is educating people. Like, yes, I want mushrooms to an MDMA to just be legal, but I also want people to know all this stuff. So then if they are engaging in this at home, then they have like more of a framework and a toolbox to be like, well, actually, geez, that was a lot. I think maybe I want to go see a therapist or not, or like whatever they want to do to work with that stuff. Um, 
And yeah, it's really interesting to me and how we're just framing the narrative and, and, and everything and the education. And yeah, I just, I, I just love that these conversations are happening at all. And, and remembering that like these really deep experiences that are getting people out of their everyday thought processes are, are really beneficial, whether they have PTSD or depression or just a person that doesn't have a clinical diagnosis, but still has, everyone has shit. Like no one's immune to having some stuff, yeah, we all have stuff. you know, like it, you don't need a clinical pathological diagnosis to have a lot of stuff down there that needs working on or coming up in fresh air. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, it's really, you don't even need a clinical diagnosis to know you have shit to work on. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think it's right. Like everyone, no one's immune to that. We're human. We have really complex, like emotional experiences all the time and that there are tools that can help us see them differently or experience ourselves differently. So powerful to me. And I just wish, yeah, like we can open people up to them in a safe way. I'm still trying to figure out how that is, but it's really interesting. <laughs> yeah. Going back to like the efficacy of like therapy, I just keep coming back to a paper I read for, you know, one of my classes in grad school and it was talking about <clears throat> like where change happens. Um, and, you know, there's so many therapy techniques out there, right? And so many people practice so differently. So it's just like, you know, to, you go to, a therapist and one therapist is going to operate completely different than another. Right. And some people have really bad experiences with therapists and, you know, that discourages them to, to go back and maybe they haven't found like the right techniques or, um, but you know, the one thing that this paper was really suggesting was the therapeutic alliance and the relationship. And that is the one big driving force in creating change, um, in a person is just having that therapeutic alliance and, and the relationship. Um, and it comes back to uh, something, a, a study that Lenny always pointed to, and I forget what it is um, and who wrote it, but um, it surveyed college students um, and it, the college students either went to an advisor or like a academic mentor or a therapist. And the results were relatively the same hmm. um, in, in, you know, change and the difference was that the person that um, went to the more uh, to the traditional therapist had more clinical lingo. <laughs> so again, I think that that points <laughs> to you know the change is also in the therapeutic relationship in that container. Um, and yeah, so I thought that was funny. It was like you know, it's people, right? It's relationship. Um, I always yeah. come back to uh, the work of Louis Casalino. I think that's how you say his name, um, the neuroscience of relationships. Um, mm. and just coming back to, you know, human, the brain is a, a social, social organ and we need relationships to, to function. And, you know, yeah. Can you develop, I guess, that container to have a deep relationship with somebody to share deep material with, to process, to unload your bags, right? We carry so much. Um, and I think that the one, it like talking about like diagnosis and, and the medicalization of therapy, <clears throat> I think it's this double-edged sword where some people really find relief in having a diagnosis and go, oh, like it gives me some sort of language that this is what's going wrong. This is what's going on with me. And I have a path forward to treat it. But that also limits people from wanting to seek out therapy because they don't either want to seem crazy. They don't want to like, maybe they don't want to identify as like being depressed or, or having some sort of diagnosis. And then people think it's, oh, therapy or counseling is only for sick people people because that's a diagnosis versus like, I have a lot of shit. I'm human and I carry around a lot of baggage and I just really need a place to, you know, unpack it and process it. Um, and hopefully find somebody that motivates me to, to make that change. Um, Absolutely. and I think we're, we're, I don't know, we, we see this little butt up against therapy and coaching. Right? I, I see it all the time in discussions with therapists where it's like, oh, coaching is more like positive. And people don't like think maybe twice about seeing a coach because it seems more goal oriented, future focused. Um, and, you know, uh, versus like therapy, it's like, oh, do I really want to go and dig up my old traumas and, you know, process this stuff? And, 
So, yeah, I don't know. I think when I think about that, it's like, where is the field going? Like what, what, and I come back to, um, the podcast that we did with, uh, Dr. Teta, the art of human care. Um, Mm -hmm. and instead of thinking about like medical care and treating, you know, clients just like, uh, like it's medical system versus like, how do we just bring like more human care into the room and what, and what, what do people actually need? Right. Um, and you know, does the field need to evolve a little bit, um, in the way that we think about health and wellness? I think the answer is yes, because you know, all, everything wants to get a clinical diagnosis. Like if you don't have a clinical diagnosis, like what are we doing? Like we don't have any, and this is maybe where I get like triggered when we say the word evidence-based. Um, like it drives me nuts, right? Cause it's well, a what great is way that? It just means up. that it got a lot of funding and it was able to get researched. And I keep coming back to that too. It's like breath work could be evidence-based if uh, people put money towards researching it. Anything could be evidence-based if you put enough time and energy and funding towards it. It's just that how many of these like techniques are actually getting funded? Um, you know, mostly it's for pharmacological interventions because there's more money to be made in a product versus more of these like therapeutic techniques. Um so I want to cut people just a little bit of slack. I want to agree with you almost a hundred percent, but we were like, it makes more money. It's also cheaper to throw pills at somebody. Um, generally speaking, than have human interaction. So, you know, like it's a yes and no, like if it works and we can throw pills at it, perfect. But it's, it's not always that effective, especially in, you know, psychiatric, uh, stuff. <sighs> Especially for mental health, right? Yeah, I know. It's so interesting. No, I'm relating to like what a lot of you guys are saying. And I mean, of course, like human connection and we live in this kind of disconnected world and so many people are depressed. Like, why is that? Why does everyone have a mental health condition? Like, is there something wrong with our society at that point where like everyone's on a psychiatric medication? Like all the freaking smartest people I know are really heavily medicated. Why is that? Uh, and it is interesting. Like, of course, MDMA is going to help you more easily form a connection, especially with a stranger, essentially like a therapist or whoever your facilitator is, just of the nature of how it makes most people feel. And like, I could see it being useful for so many different kinds of therapy, maybe as like, you know, you get comfortable with your therapist a little, and then you have an MDMA session, not even for a specific condition or diagnosis, like just to form a deeper relationship with this person. Although I could see that getting really ethically tricky and then all the abuses I hear about, and it's like, maybe that's not the best way to go about it, but it can open people up so much. And I know it's so great for my personal relationship with my partner, like, you know, just like the the amount of vulnerability and openness that you can show someone with just pure love and joy. And it's such a special experience that I I really wish could be more available. And, um, yeah, no, that's, I guess all I want to say, but I I am thinking a lot about this diagnosis thing and like, why is everyone diagnosed with something? I think it's more to do with you need it for health insurance and yada, 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 and the whole system that we live in more Mm -hmm. than like, yes, it does help people. Like I have a friend, she's like a 40 something year old single mom who just got diagnosed with ADHD. And she's like so thrilled about it. She's like, man, everything finally makes sense. Like, you know, and it is really helping her like, and, and right. And, but then on the other hand, I have a lot of friends like who, you know, kind of lean on their diagnosis too hard and use it as like an excuse not to try to get better or not to, not that that's like that easy, but like they lean on it and, and they're like, oh, my anxiety, oh, my depression, like, you know, and they own it like that instead of trying to work on it. And, and I come across this all the time. And really, since I've been doing my own work with psychedelics and starting to disconnect from my own, I'm like, maybe I don't want this anxiety. Maybe I can give it away. Like, can I go to the Salvation Army and donate this anxiety? Because I'm done with it. I don't want to take possession of it anymore. But my friends who are not in this, they're not doing this work. They're still, you know, seeing their therapists and on their medications and 
they don't think about it like that. They're happy to just stay in this system and to to not challenge their own feelings and and to to just use their diagnosis as an excuse for like everything. And it's weird to me now as in the other side of it. I'm like, well, you know, there's another way. <laughs> no one really wants to hear it until they're ready, but I don't know. I, I really struggle with this one. It's go both ways. So I just read the Saving Normal book, which is a really great critique on the DSM and, and psychiatry generally, you know, and, and it's hopeful. Like it shows a positive vision of a future psychiatry, you know, where diagnosis is more accurate and treatments are more appropriate for the indications. And, you know, we let's figure out how to not diagnose normal. Um, a big critique this person had, you know, I'm all for ADD meds and, you know, uh, <laughs> I may or may not be on Adderall right now. <laughs> I, I believe I'm highly ADD, even though I don't have uh, a diagnosis. Um, and yeah, there is um, a big loophole of overdiagnosis for things like ADD, ADHD, um, childhood bipolar, which may or may not actually be a real thing. Um, and we're throwing meds at five-year-olds, which is very ethically complicated for mm. something that, you know, if we want to go back to evidence-based, are these diagnoses in the DSM a hundred percent evidence-based? And I think the answer is clearly no. Like a, a lot of people just want to have made a splash and, you know, included stuff, um, in there, you know, what, what's the sample set for a diagnosis to fit into a DSM? You know, like do if we have five cases, is that enough for a new diagnosis there? You know, it, it, not saying that there is, but there's some really fringy diseases in there now um, that probably don't need to be in there. <laughs> they could be in, you know, more minor journal articles. Um, you know, as a result, psychiatrists have this like insane tool that's not necessarily super helpful. And I loved this uh, author's critique too, saying... DSM is only part of the equation or should only be part of the equation for good psychiatry. It has to, you have to have a longer relationship with the individual, track them over time. Like the idea that you might be grieving three weeks after losing a parent still, or like a, a close loved one and like calling that, you know, major depressive disorder. Like that is relatively common, even though that's super normal and probably something that should be outside the scope of clinical diagnosis. If the person isn't going to be hurting themselves or others or, you know, oh, yeah. looks like they're never going to heal, you know. And starting, you know, like do no harm. First, do no harm. Like let's study Hippocrates a little bit and figure out how to do this well. Like maybe we can do stuff with food, sleep, exercise first, and then we can introduce yeah. drugs. And go ahead, yeah. Kyle. It sounds like you got something to say there. No, and I mean, that's like what Raquel was saying too, like in our class, uh, was that two weeks ago? Um, before even engaging, saying like ketamine therapy, like, you know, how's your exercise? How's your diet? Have you had any like, you know, lifestyle changes first before actually engaging in it? Um, and if not, like, how do you get that really um, in line? And how do you start to make those lifestyle changes before, you know, trying anything else? Um, yeah, like I've noticed just being, getting back in my body a little bit more and, and exercising a hell of a lot more. I'm like, oh, wow, <laughs> what have I been doing for these past few years of not doing that? Um, and, and definitely have noticed a shift. It's like, oh, okay, wow. Uh, it feels like just stuck energy that's been in my body that just needs to express itself and move, get out um, through like, you know, deep breathing and fatigue. <laughs> um, and yeah, I think it's it's super important. Um, yeah, and something else came up. I remember when um, Joe, we were like going through that ethics paper with Lenny. Um, I came across a really interesting paper about the um, just about mental health diagnoses in general, and just what is a mental health disorder, and not really being able to locate it in the brain like <laughs> a normal disease. But there was an interesting quote in that paper um, saying like. Most of these are um, 
they're not necessarily medical problems. They're mostly societal problems. And most kind of, um, they're like, you know, adaptations of adversity, right? Like we need to really be able to adapt to our, our environments. Um, and, you know, maybe that's where the depression, anxiety and trauma comes into play, right? Um, and so they were really arguing instead of medical interventions, how do we have more social interventions and social solutions here than just trying to constantly pathologize it within that medical uh, worldview. Um, I thought that was, that was really interesting. Um, ha- again, I think we might've mentioned this on a, uh, on the podcast um, a couple weeks ago, right? Like when the society's sick, the individual's sick. Um, and when individuals are sick, society are sick. And, you know, it's all interconnected there. Um, and something else I, I come back to just thinking about this like trauma informed approach. And I really like this rephrasing. Um, I learned this in, uh, I forget what type of training it was in. Um, but instead of asking somebody what's wrong with you, maybe try to ask what's happened to you. Um, right. A lot of us are carrying very heavy events or experiences. And, you know, does that necessarily make something wrong with you or are you just, you know, s- shook up from an event, from an experience in your life that you just really can't release. Um, and that's just been impacting you on, on so many different levels. So, And let's like even try to define sick or health, right? Like, um, you know, my, my idea of a healthy system is something that um, should be relatively resilient to bumps in the road. Um, you know, uh, an unhealthy ecosystem will totally collapse Mm -hmm. and, you know, thousands of species could die versus a healthy ecosystem that can handle, you know, two, um, 55 gallon drums of oil spilling into the environment. Like that ecosystem can still survive. And like, if we look at it in terms of a body, very similar, you know, it's an ecosystem of biology, but we've also got like psyche in the mix too. So we've got to figure out this kind of like, physical and psychic balance of, you know, (laughs) can I handle something really fucked up happening? (laughs) Kyle's kind of goes towards your point of, do you have the space in your life for this to go bad temporarily? Um, And it depends on, you know, what's their level of personal resilience. Um, And there's, Mm -hmm. you know, gut flora, there's, you know, hormones and neurotransmitters in the mix in this story too. Um, You know, if you're overusing MDMA, like for instance, like two to three times a week at high doses, oh, God. you're going to be less resilient than somebody who maybe only uses it once a quarter. Um, because, you know, I know this from personal experience, right? <laughs> like, you know, when I use it less, I do better. Yeah. Um, I'm not at one, even once a quarter now, I'm kind of feeling freaking out. Like I need more drugs, but, um, <laughs> I'll try to sort that out <laughs> eventually. Um, But, you know, quarantine, like to your point, Kyle, about exercise, like I have not exercised anywhere close to how I was exercising before since the gyms closed in Colorado. They didn't really close, right? It's just I don't believe I can do the kind of exercise I want with a mask on. So I'm already almost passing out, being a dummy in the gym and getting hurt, (laughs) you know? So, yeah. So like I'm, I'm deficient in where I need to be to feel that kind of health that you were talking about even though maybe I'm getting outside and skiing all the time, it's very different from like a focused exercise routine, trying to keep my body healthy. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. It just makes me think about just a more holistic approach. I mean, you just brought up gut flora. So now I'm thinking, well, yeah, sometimes it is medical. Right. (laughs) And so I guess like thinking about a more holistic approach here, um, what we have like three to five pounds of gut biome and there is this, uh, (laughs) connection between anxiety and depression, um, when that kind of gets out of balance. And so, yeah, I think it is important to look at this at a holistic approach and taking consider like consideration of the medical, um, stuff that may be going on with, with folks. And if that's in check, you know, then do something else. Yeah. Yeah, no, this is before we move on, I guess this keeps reminding me this idea of like, you know, what is being sick? It reminds me of Bette Williams new book, The Wild Kindness. And one of the big realizations that she has on a mushroom trip, she's like, you know, talking to the mushrooms and she's like, oh, but I, I can't do all that because I'm sick. And they're just like, 
you're not sick. You just think you are. Like, just let that go, basically. And it's so powerful. I identified with it so much because it is so similar to my mushroom lessons and being told my diagnosis is depression and anxiety and I'll never get over it and I should just learn to take these pills and, you know, they screwed up my appetite and my sleep schedule and all these things when then I took mushrooms and it was so different. And they were like, you're choosing all of that. You can choose something else. And it's like, not that that is that way for everyone, but, um, I don't know, just the way she phrased it. If people listening haven't read her book yet, it's really powerful. It really helped me think about sickness and wellness and what that all means in a new way. And I really recommend it. (laughs) Yeah, that's interesting. I had a similar experience when I was down in Costa Rica. Um, kind of like this energetic parasite that I keep feeding by like, you know, sugary foods, carbs. Um, again, maybe thinking about gut biome on that level, but then, yeah, just like, um, you know, different thoughts, um, behaviors, and just how it kind of keeps this like energetic parasite inside of me alive. And I was like, oh, how do I just stop feeding that? How do I change up my routine? How do I change up my diet? How do I like actually think about it in in that type of metaphorical way and be like, can I actually develop a relationship with this energetic thing inside of me? Maybe not feed it anymore. Um, and I did pretty well until the pandemic started back. <laughs> and then it was like, boom, back into, you know, old habits and um, yeah, just being inside um, much. But yeah, I, I mean, I still have that image like in my mind. I'm like, it's an interesting thing to think about because I think it, it does embody a holistic thing. It's like, what am I putting in my body? How am I feeding it that way? How am I feeding it with my thoughts? How am I feeding it with certain actions and behaviors? And what happens when I start to change that? Um, and, you know, do I slowly kind of kill off that energetic thing inside of me that I keep feeding? Oh, that's beautiful. Or starve it. Maybe not kill it off, but, you know, <laughs> starve it a little bit. <laughs> I love that, Kyle. Thank you for sharing that. That's really inspiring. <laughs> All right. Yes. Should so, we move on? Um, yeah. What's next? <laughs> yes. What's next? I'll let you just go down these rabbit holes. <laughs> yeah, That's <right>. fun. <laughs> I think I think the next one up was the uh, a CEO of a two billion dollar startup fired after experimenting with LSD at work. Yeah. So that was in Forbes and Bloomberg last week. Um, the CEO is Justin. Um, Zoo, I think that's how you say his last name. He's a co-founder and chief executive of the multi-billion dollar marketing startup Iterable. Uh, Says he was ousted from the company. This is his report, by the way, after microdosing LSD in the workplace, um, which both articles, you know, go on to explain is common practice in Silicon Valley. I had mixed feelings about this one because on the one hand, like I kind of... I admire him for being open about his LSD use, um, you know, because we are talking about people coming out of the closet and and trying to normalize this stuff. But on the other hand, it is kind of like shit. Like, should we give rich, you know, influential CEOs a pass when, like, I don't know, if a normal person or a black person or a woman was caught microdosing at her daycare job or some other, like, working class job, they would have totally been fired. It wouldn't have been headlines, right? And so... I think it comes down to this kind of like exceptionalism and classism in a way, like what social class is allowed to use psychedelics and what isn't. And I almost kind of liked that he was fired because it was like, yeah, you know, you can't get away with this. We need to make it equal for everyone before you can be microdosing at work. But on the other hand, it's like, crap, like, I don't know. Are we going to just fire everyone who's open and trying to destigmatize in their own communities? So it was complicated for me. I had definitely mixed feelings about this one. I wonder what you guys thought. Do you feel bad for the guy? I don't feel bad for anyone with $2 million, but like, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe a little, like not really. I think he'll find something else. So just use his money to do some other project and probably start to probably like patent LSD or something and it'll be fine. (laughs) Yeah. Welcome to the party, Jason. Um, (laughs) No, it's, uh, (laughs) it's interesting, right? It's a good social commentary, Michelle. Like, Yes. Like the, the article almost wants to apologize for this person and like says, 
oh, this person should keep their job. But it's like, really? Mm, well, you broke the rules of your thing. Um, you know, you signed that contract. You kind of knew what you were getting into to a degree. I want to know how this person got busted. Were they like posting about it on Slack? Cool. Look at this like uh, highly illegal drug I'm eating at work. You know, like I don't, I don't know how this came about. So like more context to be helpful for, you know, passing judgment, but really it's, um, hmm. yeah, I don't know. Like this person knew what they were getting into. Um, and you know, yes, I wish LSD was legal. Um, but you know, this person entered into those terms, they're not going to jail. Right. And this is more of a interpersonal, like corporate, you know, situation. So it's like, what, what's the real, what's the deal here? What do we want to do? Um, I don't know, Kyle, what did, what did you think? Um, well, it's interesting, Michelle, you kind of brought up those points. Um, kind of has me thinking, you know, just thinking about tech world, startup world, um, that list that psychedelic invest just put out, um, congrats <laughs> Joe for into that creating on it as well. Um, <laughs> the hundred most influential people and, you know, it's like, yeah. Um, you know, it makes it okay if you're, you know, making lots of money, um, and being very kind of influential that way and having a lot of these startups that it's okay to engage in that. But what about like minority populations that like, you know, can't get away with this? Um, and why are we always kind of putting like, uh, tech billionaires and millionaires up on a pedestal when there's a lot of great work going on in the underground and smaller communities? Um, and so, yeah, um, Interesting. I agree. Yeah. Like what is with the cultural phenomenon of making like millionaires into celebrities and like worshiping them? That makes me sick. Like, I don't care at <laughs> all about all these guys. Like what? That's like the least cool thing I could possibly imagine. Yet even in the psychedelic world, we do it and I don't get it. I'm like, it's not cool to be a billionaire that makes his billions by taking advantage of all of his workers. Like that's like the opposite of cool in my, I guess, definition of cool. Um, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about that list. Right. So there was a list, um, last week that Kyle just mentioned a hundred most influential people in psychedelics that caused a freaking uproar, you know, rightfully on social media because the list was really gross. <laughs> like, uh, this is my opinion, but well, and the then, headline picture too, yes, right? They it's took like it down. all entrepreneur te- like, all oh, white guys, all rich all white, white guys. Men. Yep. Yeah. Like, and you know, and it was all really rich guys. Like from Tim Ferriss to Joe Rogan to Paul Stamets, like, you know, they do great things for the community, but like, they're just the loudest voices with the most money. They had money to start with like they, you know, and then, and then they're, uh, and so I guess, oh, this list, I have so many feelings and I just want to scream, but. Uh, well, you brought up a good point. Like what is like influential and like yeah. the myth offers weren't even there. I mean, they've been leading the MDMA training. Um, you know, they've trained so many different therapists and clinicians for this type of therapy. And I, put them high up on that list as well. Um, and not really kind of targeting people that are actually doing work. They're just kind of targeting people that had a lot of capital to that built companies or, or were very loud. Um, yeah. And like who puts Tim Ferriss before Rick Doblin? Like if you're going to put a number one white man on this list, let's just give Rick the credit he deserves. He's yeah. been doing this since before I was born. Like, you know, I don't agree with everything maps does, but like without the work that he's been doing for decades, like we would not be where we are today. I am very comfortable admitting that. Like that's obvious. There were so many psychedelic elders missing from this list that like none of what Tim Ferriss or Joe Rogan or all the like celebrity athletes who like I've interviewed, like sure, but like they would not have their platform or even be comfortable talking about any psychedelic use that they're doing if it wasn't for the work of like Kat Harrison, who's not on this list and like yeah. all these yeah. other just like long standing researchers and activists, like no one from the decriminalized nature, anyone working on policy was on this list. It was like, there was no women until number 20 and it's someone's wife. Like what 
decade are we in? Like, the, and then there's no woman who's not a millionaire investor until 40 something. Like what? Like I, like hardly any people of color, like just like, well, yeah, how do we define influence? Is it just the richest people who have the best PR people who, you know, then get the most press and then like, it just creates this like just the spiral of just like, you know, rich people getting to do whatever they want. And the rest of us just have to like watch us like, oh, and celebrity gaze them like they're so great. And thank you so much for using drugs while I can't because I'll go to jail if I like, you know, or like mm, I'm getting too emotional. You guys, maybe you should take over. <laughs> oh, I'm good. so angry. <laughs> But yeah, it was disheartening. A, I guess what one. else I'll say is just like as a woman in the space, it basically showed me that like there's no hope for me. Like, you know, like because I don't have all the money and all the stuff, like so I'll never like I'll never be able to be on this level. And I guess that just kind of was really disheartening. It's just kind of like we're just going to make psychedelia like every other celebrity corporate enterprise. Like this is BS. Like this is not what this is about. And like, I'm angry. <laughs> Sorry. There's room for you. And, and <laughs> oh, I'm making right. it. <laughs> You'll make our list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just like listing people like that is so gross. Like why call them the most influential? Just call them a hundred people in psychedelics doing great things. Like, you know, like when we did a list of like nine women of color, we didn't say like, these are the best and blah, 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 blah. it's just like, these are nine women who are doing cool stuff that we want you to hear about. And I really personally prefer to uplift voices who are not part of this mainstream dialogue, who don't get all the attention because they don't have all the money to hire all the right agencies and do all the right things. But clearly, you know, when it comes to an a uh, website like psychedelicinvest.com. That's not as important. And I do realize that, but it was, it was yeah, I mean, lot. they're definitely hitting that niche audience of, of investors. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think you made a comment like Dr. Ben Sessa brought up on Twitter, like, um, about, you know, a lot of this research takes a lot of funds and money. Um, and so, you know, it makes sense to have some of these people that were able to get capital um, to start running a lot of these studies like Compass or JR MindMed and, and stuff like that. It's really kind of like um, sped things up to some degree. And a lot of these companies that are coming out of nowhere that have the capital to do the research, um, you know, and I, I guess, you know, Ben does have a point here, right? Um, does cost a lot of money to to do this research and to um, create some sort of policy change. And with when I think about all this stuff happening, it is creating some ripples, right? We're having evidence based research here of proving the efficacy of, of these medicines and substances that will uh, attract mainstream attention. But um, yeah, I guess that's the the riff maybe between like uh, the old school psychedelic community underground battling up against like um, corporate psychedelia. Um, and it's like, hey, what's going on here? There's been tons of people doing great work. And I, I saw a comment by somebody saying, oh, JR should be number one on that list. <laughs> and I'm thinking like, I think like if anything, like going back to your comment, Michelle, like Rick Doblin, I mean, there's tons of people that I, I believe should be on top of that, but like... Maps has been pioneering this for so long, right? And I mean, really opened up the narrative for a lot of people. Um, it, you know, if we want to approach it from that perspective of like the research opening up, get, gaining mainstream attention, like Rick and Maps have really opened up this narrative for so many people. And, you know, it's taken years and years. I mean, just thinking like how long they've been at it. Um, and so... <laughs> Great job, Maps and Rick. Just got to put it out there. I mean, we probably wouldn't be doing what we're doing if they no. weren't helping to destigmatize this, right? Um, and again, you know, with the early research with, you know, Rick Strassman and then Johns Hopkins putting that research out. Yeah, Rick Strassman wasn't on that list, right? There's not a single indigenous person on that list. Like just yeah. so many people left out that just everyone on the list is you know, building on their foundation, which I guess was what was like pretty insulting to the community. Um, 
And just like, what year is it that you're going to make a list of all white men? Like, come on. Like, uh, oh, what about like uh, the Irwids? Jeez. I mean, they should definitely be on that right? list too. Very influential in my research and journey here. Same. Like, um, if th- there was no such thing as Irwid when I was a teen, like experimenting with this stuff. Like, where would I be? Like, yeah, yeah, it was really disheartening. Um, there was another list created that's a lot better. Still not perfect. Um, I mean, no list is going to be perfect, right? Unless no. it's written by like a really old head in the community who knows everyone and then maybe could. But then they'd still have their own bias and rank like all their old friends and it would just be like a whole other thing. Well, that's what I was thinking. Like if we created a list, I'd probably just go and like people that we interview that were very influential. And it's like, okay, that's still a biased list. Every right? list because is going to be like biased. Going through our own community and our own like um, you connections know, and just like who we identify with. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah, just don't make lists like that. Like, ew, these lists are gross. Can everyone please stop making them? I think that's my main takeaway. Like, this is not... It's the just, clickbait stuff, right? Yeah. It, I mean, it got all of our attentions it and did. definitely kind of ruffled feathers and made people angry and pissed and started a conversation. So. It did exactly like, yeah, like, you know, it's actually a great PR strategy. Like, what's a better PR strategy yeah. than a wee bit of controversy and people getting angry yep. in the comment section? You're going to raise your engagement and your clicks and your reach. Yep. And so... I respect them for that. (laughs) (laughs) Good PR move. Yeah, right? From a media perspective, great job. From a human perspective, please don't ever do this again. They they put out a, a statement, which was also just so flawed and gross and like, oh, this is all based on like social media reach, which isn't true. I know so many like women and people of color with like way bigger followings and a lot of the people on that list. So I think that was just kind of BS. Had small ones. I mean, yeah. yeah uh, like, I mean, I'm glad, you know, we were on there with Joe representing. It's like, yeah, our Instagram's huge. Not to like boast about it, but I mean, we have a big social reach. Exactly. Yeah. And then there were people on there with like, really not. And it's like, well, that can't be the, uh, but they had money. So I guess it doesn't matter. Uh, yeah. Joe, what are your thoughts? <laughs> <sighs> they could have mentioned that I was with psychedelics today. I don't, I don't think they mentioned it in the post. Is that right? Um, not the original yeah, one. Was, they might have edited to add a link when they updated, but no. It was just like, here's a random other white guy. No offense, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, you know, this is weird. And so I'm scrolling through it going like, either Kyle and I better be listed in here. Like, this is insane. As I get to like number 20, I'm like, good Lord, what is happening here? <laughs> and then by the time I see myself at 84, 85, I'm like, okay, cool. But what a friggin' weird thing. Um, and to not include like Kyle I, too, like what the F? <laughs> right. I was like, I run my mouth. Of course, I'm too. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know. It's a really strange deal. Um, I, and you guys are so influential. Like you're teaching so many new therapists about this stuff. And then to be like at the end of the list, like after all these people who have like really not affected the community and the movement to any way that you all have and, and so many others was just like, it's kind of sickening. We need better We're not marketing very loud PR. about what we do. Um, like Kyle and I could be a lot louder about what we do and the kind of influence we have. We need to figure out how to do that because apparently that's what works and gets influence. Like if we copy what Rick is doing, we probably do really well. Um, yeah. Rick is a master of PR and, um, you know, thank God for that. Um, but yeah, like I, I think it just goes to show that, you know, um, I'm, I'm reminded of Christine Hauskeller, a uh, professor uh, who is part of the Exeter Conference, talking a lot about how anything, um, once it becomes popular enough, money comes in. You know, yeah. Che Guevara t-shirts, like Sex Pistols merch, um, you know, nothing. You know, things that are punk or counterculture become not counterculture relatively quickly. And yeah. we've got to really be careful. Um but, you know, really, how careful can we be? Um, I was talking to somebody the other day and it's like, you know, we can talk about critical theory, you know, post-Marx, Marxism, as much as we want till we're blue in the face. But what change are you going to really have unless we have somebody you can elect in or you get violent? 
you know, I, I see a lot of people in the psychedelic space and they just go hard, but it's like, you're not necessarily going to make the kind of impact you want to make unless you have like politicians helping you out or you're willing to do violence, which probably isn't the right move these days. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, is it all political? Maybe like, do you need a psychedelic super PAC? You know, good luck, you know, <laughs> having the right ideology to attract the right people. But, you know, we, we do need lobbyists. So like money is kind of essential here. Mm -hmm. But how do we attract the right kind of capital so that we can make the right kind of progress? Um, not like, okay, cool. Like I took your money. Now I'm going to make sure you can't access psilocybin. You know, I, I haven't seen evidence that any of these people want to do this yet, but it's a sneaking suspicion that they do want to do it. Um, because why would they want you to cut into their profits? Um, so, you know, food for thought, <laughs> uh, after the hundred person list. Yeah. So I, I noticed we're at like over an hour, any kind of closing thoughts from either of you on, on this list or anything else? No, no, I don't think so. There was one more article we were thinking of talking about. We could talk about it next week, maybe. Um, but Let's do it real quick. What is it? The FDA proposed a ban on menthol flavored cigarettes and Ugh. which also includes flavored blunt wraps like Swisher and Backwoods. And this is causing another uh, uproar. <laughs> is tobacco regulation racist? Or like what what is it about tobacco regulation that gets everybody all stoked? Like I know people that have, I know I have multiple family members who've died from lung cancer. Um, but I don't necessarily think we should try to outlaw things like that. Yeah. Know. And that's Any kind of the comments? reasoning in this article, right? Because this is targeting the black community. The black community smokes menthol cigarettes and flavored blunts, like at a higher rate than other communities. And, and it says in the article that that's an attempt to help the black community because black men have the highest rates of lung cancer in the country. But in my mind, I can't help but think that this is going to create an illegal underground market for menthol cigarettes and flavored blunt wraps. And then what? Are we going to have an excuse to like arrest more black men for like possessing or maybe selling these on the underground market? Like cartons and Newports are going to be really expensive. People love Newports. It's just like a thing. I can't explain it. Actually, I used to smoke Newports. It's disgusting, but they're just really good. Like, I don't know. It was a phase. And uh, But like, so that has nothing to do with me, but like, I think that this is a bad move. I think that this is going to create an unregulated market and it's going to create more problems than it's going to solve. I think education in the black community against smoking maybe is a better call. Um, or like, like there are other options. We learned so many times that prohibition doesn't work. Like why, why would we think this is a good idea? Like what? Like I think we should be like getting people out of jail for cannabis possession legalizing cannabis federally before we start proposing bans on something that like hundreds of thousands of people buy every day, like maybe get better packaging, maybe like, you know, packaging like in Mexico, the, all the cigarette packs are disgusting. There's like pictures of dead babies and black lungs to try to like get people to stop smoking. Like maybe we need better oh. regulation around these things and rules around marketing and education campaigns rather than a proposed ban that could just like get more people in trouble, I think in my, that's my two cents. I wanted to bring it up. Right. We can't lock people up as easy for cannabis now. So let's do it for something different. Kyle, we didn't get to hear from you. Well, I'm coming back to, again, um, <clears throat> these like medical changes or medical approaches. This is bad. So let's get rid of it versus <laughs> like a societal thing of like, why do people smoke to begin with? And, you know, if it feels targeted t towards like African-Americans, like, well, what's their living environment? Like what type of like communities do they live in? Why are they smoking? Are they highly stressed? And this is like the, the form to have stress reduction. And it's like, you know, targeting that. And so again, I don't know, I come back to, I guess, like that bigger picture, um, kind of like systemic issues here. And it's just like, oh yeah, um, well, we just want to take this away from from you, even though it might be, again, thinking about like 
our conversations with Carl Hart, a lot of people are self-medicating, right? Um, you know, a lot of people find a lot of stress reduction um, and relaxation with cigarettes. Um, and it's just like, oh, well, we're going to take it away. It's like, well, what about like boosting up those communities in different ways, um, more accessibility to jobs, housing, et cetera. Higher um, incomes. So like- I don't know. That's where that that's where my mind goes. Yeah, higher income. No. But yeah, it's kind of a weird move to want to ban this stuff. And I get it from like a health perspective of like, all right, like maybe, you know, flavored stuff is, you know, kids find it attractive and then they get hooked early on. And it's part of the uh, argument. But again, I don't know. I think it's, yeah, but I do find it to be weird. It was a weird one. Mm. Yeah, it's, it just doesn't make much sense. Like, and we still, don't we still have flavored nicotine vapes? That That's like what all the teens love, I right? think they got rid of that. They I did. was actually just at a friend's house who um, does a lot of vaping and he had flavorless vape and he said that um, they don't have any flavors Interesting. anymore, supposedly. <sighs> yeah. I could be wrong about that in other states. I don't know if it's just here, or, but yeah, I was. New Jersey does that. have strict cigarette laws. Like when I was a young person, they raised the buying limit to nineteen, and now I'm like twenty one now. Like I remember when it was yeah. nineteen, and then we'd all go to New York City to buy cigarettes. <laughs> but um, because that's what happens. You find a way around it if you like. Ugh. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, this wasn't. This was upsetting, you know. Um, and also, you know. If you're looking for other ways around blunts, I would recommend hemp wraps. That's the only other thing I wanted to say. I don't think they'll be part of this legislation because they're not made out of tobacco. I do understand blunts hit different. Blunts are a cultural and social thing. They're fun to pass around friends. Not that you should be sharing blunts right now, everybody, but uh, (laughs) it's just like, uh, it just seems like a cultural, another cultural war thing that like, you know, just didn't make any sense to me and was kind of upsetting. What about cellophane wraps? (laughs) Remember when those were a thing? Like those celery oh, yeah. clear rolling papers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They're still out there. They're supposed to be a little better. I like the now the Kanamo or not the hemp um, rolling papers um, uh, personally. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, this is, it's just a trend, right? Like the establishment wants us to think that they are keeping us safe so that they can continue to justify their existence. That's one of my reads. Um, I understand how that's pretty cynical, but it's kind of the way it's been. You know, oh, you're smoking cannabis? We're going to put you in jail and take your kids away because it's what's best. It's like, well, you know, that sounds like a nightmare, first off. (laughs) And secondly, like, where's your data? You know, like, where's your data that prohibition has ever worked? Ever, ever, ever. Um, prohibition is harmful on so many, for so many reasons. Um, all right. We cool to wrap. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Wraps. We are. <laughs> um, all right. Well, thank you all for listening. This has been fun. Um, reminder, navigating psychedelics for clinicians and therapists kicks off in 13 days from the day you'll be hearing this. Uh, if you listen to it on a Friday. So May 20 is our kickoff date. We do have CEs there. Um, it's an amazing foundations course for understanding where you're going to be going. Um, in this space might help you figure out your future direction and and much more also networking and you get some time with Kyle and I, which of course is special. So, um, (laughs) uh, we've, yeah, uh, I've got the serotonergic psychedelics course coming up, coming up with Dr. Melanie Pincus, a neuroscientist trained at Emory and Stanford, I believe. And, um, I think Stanford undergrad based on my LinkedIn spying recently, Kyle, um, and then, um, yeah, I mean, she I think has she's a even teaching at Columbia. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, people can find that course on psychedelic education center as well. Um, no, that one, um, is actually on psychedelics today slash events. There's a link there and that actually goes to our Shopify page where cool. you can purchase that class. Right on. And then, um, our five year birthday party on May 13, it's going to be fun. So stay tuned, everybody. Sign More details that? coming soon. Um, we're going to have a page, um, an events listing. Um, I think it's psychedelicstoday.com slash events or on social media. <coughs> like probably have one on um, Facebook and one on LinkedIn. And we'll probably have a link on our welcome page as well. Psychedelicstoday.com slash welcome. Um, I'm not really sure how we're going to do it yet. 
Um, but stay tuned. I think we're going to use Twitch. Uh, it's going to be totally free that one. And we will take questions from the audience and I will also be there. So everyone should come. I think it's going to be fun. I plan on asking Joe and Kyle all about how and why they started psychedelics today. Five whole years ago. Mm. I like actually can't believe it. I think it's going to be a great evening. Thursday, next Thursday evening, like seven 30 Eastern, I think is what we planned. So hope to see you guys all there. Yes. <laughs> right on. All right. Well, thank, thank you, everybody. Michelle. Thank you, Kyle. Um, thank you all for listening. If your ears weren't out there, we couldn't be doing it. Um, and check out what we've been doing on YouTube. We got these really cool videos up there. And I don't know if either of you have seen it, but Mike's been doing some really funny video edits um, that really <sighs> made me laugh. So stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, for instance, you were even in last Friday for about one second. Um, <laughs> cool. <laughs> I'll have to check it out. Yeah, so there's Easter eggs out there. (laughs) Nice. All right, everybody. Thanks again. Um, Learn about our classes at psychedeliceducationcenter.com and we'll be in touch about the birthday party and see you real soon. Joe Moore signing off. See y'all later. (laughs) 